welcome to SAE Tomorrow Today. I am your host, Grayson Brulte. On today's episode, we're absolutely honored to have Gino Cafiero, co-founder and CEO of Bear Flag Robotics, and Aubrey Donnellan, co-founder and COO of Bear Flag Robotics. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, Grayson. Thanks for having us. You're welcome. What you're doing is super, super cool. And so I'm excited to dive into this. But before we dive into it, I want to uh, take a trip down memory lane. You first met at Carnegie Mellon over 20 years ago. Now you're building Bear Flag Robotics together. What was it like to build a company with an old friend that you trust? The best. I mean, that's the most, well, that's the most <laughs> important part, right? Um, we talk about this quite a bit. Uh, one of the one of the fantastic bits about growing this company with Aubrey is how we see the world so differently and the perspective, perspectives that we bring to the company and the industry, but also having that underlying trust of knowing that we're both moving in the same direction, wanting the best thing for the company, even, even if conversations get tense or we diametrically have diametrically opposing perspectives. Yep. Yep. I mean, diversity of thought diversity of people, background, experiences is what enhances any team's effectiveness. It's like why we focus on it at Bear Flag too. And so if you think about a founding team when it's just a few of you on a dream, literally in Egino's garage, um, you know, it's hard to do it alone. You get caught in your head. And I think having having somebody that you can trust, be transparent with, own all of your bad decisions, everything you don't know. Um, that's the key to being able to have longevity in the process because it's, it's not a quick, a quick journey. Absolutely fantastic because you're looking at it from, from different perspectives of the world and then you bring those perspectives to kind of try and find that middle ground of what's going to be the best for the company and your customers. No, that's great. And that's exactly right. And it's not just, you know, me and Aubrey too. We're running this incredibly exciting company where we have this operation side of the business with ag professionals and we have this engineering side of the business with some of the finest roboticists I've ever had the pleasure of working with in my life. And how do you, how do you encourage communication? How do you encourage cooperation on teams that come from such a vastly different background that have different ways of attacking problems? We talk about this all the time. There's a, I, the metaphor is there's a chair in the middle of the room and we're all standing on different, in different corners of the room, but we're looking at the same chair. And how do we see that? How do we describe that? That's going to be different, but we're all looking at the same thing. And how can we increase communication across the team to be most effective and productive as possible? Listen, we haven't always gotten it right. Um, it's a it's a process, not a point. Um, but it's something we focus on quite intently. And, and Aubrey, is this, you're, you're setting, you and Gina were setting a clear example for, for trusted communication. Is that going out throughout the organization so individuals see the trust that you that you two have together? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we, as much as we try to align ourselves um, and make sure that, that we both know where we agree, know where we don't agree, you know, before we, we talk to the team, um, every team environment, every meeting that we have um, and get together and crop circle that we stand in with our trackers is, is open and honest communication. And we preach it. We try to lead by example. Um, and, and ownership is a really big value that, that we focus on in the company, just owning Owning your feelings, whatever they are, owning your disagreements, your concerns, your excitement. Um, and I think it's it's done well for building a great culture at our company, truly. Did that culture start to emerge in the summer of 2017 when you spoke every day or kicking around ideas? And you said, okay, I want to. we want to build a business together. What are we going to do? And then is that kind of where it all started, Aubrey? Yeah, I, I you know... I don't know if it was ownership so much as Egino and I feeling very strongly that we wanted to bring something to the world that was good and, and valuable. I know that sounds very simplistic and idealistic maybe, but, but at the point in our careers that we were at, um, that's what we wanted to do. And so when we were in the process of ideating around a prototype um, technology that had come out that Egino was experimenting with, and then talking to customers, it was really all of that customer development that drove our decisions to choose a market and a customer um, to go after. And that's really what pulled us into agriculture. Um, so, did you know, yeah. in that garage, did you have a tractor that you were experimenting with and having a good old time? <laughs> God, we started no. on a no. <laughs> we started on a side by side. It's still in the shop right now. Um, 
literally the last time I used it was to get beer um, at down the street. <laughs> so we're not yes. we're not using it anymore, but it's there. It's a bit of a museum piece. Still end up in the Smithsonian one day? Someday. <laughs> or the Monterey Airport, maybe. On <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's fantastic though because you're taking a lead, leading edge on the technology you're doing really good with the farmers and we're going to get to this in a bit that really need your help but i want to point out you've got an awesome business model with tractor as a service how did aubrey how did that model come together because it's it's incredible as we dive into it you're making it sustainable for the farmers to farm more land because of tractor as a service model exactly i mean we how we came into it was was simply getting out there and, and doing the thing ourselves. We have always said since the beginning days that, that being out there and doing it is the only way to build this company, to extract all the learning that you can, fast iterative development process, very close communication with customers, getting feedback constantly. That is how a venture-backed company grows quickly. It's not and people know this, but it's it's not building a product in isolation and trying to ship it to customers and sell them on why they need it. Um, and so really delivering a service allowed us to understand the customer's problems firsthand, talking to them every single day, understand the challenges of building an autonomous machine that operates in these very rugged environments and going to different farms, different times of day, different seasons in the year, different soil types. All these things create a really, really robust data set that we're now using to build the product that can scale bigger than, you know, California, which is where we are today. And so it was by necessity that we built this as a service. And what we found is as we've been delivering as a service, there's so many benefits to scaling as a service as well, especially when you're dealing with autonomous machines. And we can talk about it later, but... um, Yeah, it's proven to be a wonderful business model. And I encourage any founder of a robotics company to consider building a service around your product, especially in early stages, to get all those learnings and understand what it takes to to have a physical robot operating out in the real world. Do you know, it's brilliant because you're you're getting all the ability to learn. You're not asking a customer to write you a multi-million dollar check up front. But in the long term, you're building a massively sustainable business that will allow you to scale and grow and be highly profitable and fully independent if you if you choose, unless Mr. John Deere or Caterpillar come knocking on your door with a with a check that starts with a B, then that's a a different (laughs) conversation to have. So let's dive into the economics here for a moment. How is the bear service uh, priced? How how is it priced? Is it by by acre or how, how does that work? Yeah, great. And we've looked at this every which way and we just keep coming back to this per acre pricing. It just keeps it simple. And in the early days, you know, we, we talked about all kinds of stuff, you know, charging per hour, per, um, you know, uh, per, per um, you know, unit of crops, you know, tilled or whatever that could be. And it just kept coming back to acres. You know, we get paid for the work we do. And you know, in the early days, we were worried, hey, you know, what happens if we have downtime? We don't want the customer driving by the field and seeing us scratching our heads, wondering why it's not working and paying us for that. Like, happily, that doesn't happen too much anymore. But the per acre pricing is what makes sense. Um, folks, that's how that's how folks think about their operations. And furthermore, you know, that's that's the job that we're delivering. When you think about a service model, the you know, the, the, the customer, the growers in our situations, they don't care if it's a man tractor, an unmanned tractor, a tractor driven by a little green man. They care about the tillage being done. They care about the bed setup. They care about all the things that we're doing for them. Our product is their field, how they want it. And so in that regards, per acre pricing really does make sense. Do you customize your product depending on the type of the farm or the application that that farmer is hiring you for? In a, in a word, yes. I mean, um, Every, every farm is different, right? So we talked to some farmers and how this implement or that implement. Um, but what we're really doing the way that we succeed is building a framework underneath it. So we have a framework where we can in- ingest different parameters. So whether it's going to be a chisel or a disc, um, you know, certainly there's there's things we do differently for those, but it's in the same framework. And so for us, you know, early days, we'd see a new thing and be like, holy smokes, this is going to take forever. And we go back and like try to figure out. But now that we have this library We've seen, you know, ninety-eight percent of all the things out there, and um, we're easily adjustable. Um, we necessarily in agriculture, 
there is not a one size fits all. And so the secret sauce here is building that framework. I would look at it more as it's not customization, it's configuration for a customer. And, and once you do that configuration to, like Eugenia said, their implements and their fields, they're running those operations every single year. They don't change. The fields don't change. And so if it's a small upfront investment, it's very small that then has gains every year that we work with them. Um, so it's, it's not highly customized. And Aubrey, looking at the, the gains that the, the, the farmers are getting, the increases of efficiency, what type of retention rate once a farm engages you and, and hires Bear Flag? So, I, you know, we, we talked about this question um, in advance, and I, I'll ask you, Gino, to keep me honest, but I'm pretty sure that we haven't churned on one customer yet that we've, we've had a contract and delivered to. Exactly right. Is that right? Yeah, and I, I didn't want to say that without double checking. Um, because I'm very honest about stuff like this. I'm, I am sure we will have churn. Um, but no, when when we go out to growers and growers see what we're doing, um, it's, it's the proof is in the pudding. And so what they see is a highly precise machine that's driving more efficiently, that's driving like inch perfect. That people on their farm can't do. They're seeing a machine that's not taking breaks, that does not have downtime, that's not limited by overtime, um, which is a major issue um, for growers in California, a major challenge for them. Um, a machine that can run at night, uh, a machine that's bringing safety to their farm that they've never had. That these safety coordinators, you know, eh and huge at farms. Um, safety is major concern on farms. They look at us as, a huge relief, a burden lifted from them because humans are no longer being exposed to these massive hazards. And, you know, tractor tractor accidents and injuries are the number one reason for injury and death on farms today. And then you extend that out to possible health issues people have because of exposure to dust, illness, chemicals that might be on the farm. And it's just been, these jobs are inherently unsafe. Um, and so that's been I think they see that and they, they see a future um, where they're not limited and they keep buying. <laughs> the no churn rate is absolutely incredibly fantastically awesome. And it just says a ton about your product and you've talked about the advantages. And, and so is that the main advantage for a farmer to hire you instead of going out and buying a tractor and trying to pull in a Geno and build it in his garage and, and they can go get beer at the local store for him and then come back to the farm? Farmers are very comfortable with leasing today. Uh, they lease all the time. Some people prefer to buy. There's pros and cons and you go down a rabbit hole about those pros and cons from taxation and, and from a finance and accounting standpoint. But they love outsourcing to us for a few major reasons. They don't have to staff up. Labor availability is a huge problem for them. And when they're calling their flag, they don't have to worry about coordinating who's going to show up um, and, and are they going to get the job done right. Um, that's a major thing. And then alongside with the staffing, that's insurance on the machines, premiums that they have to pay on their machines, as well as workers' comp insurance on the people side. So when you outsource to a service, you really are relieved from some of those burdens. And, and then you can also write off those payments as operating costs versus you know having to deal with them as capital assets in your company and so they 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 are familiar with the model and they like the model and and the last thing i'll say is is when businesses evaluate when to outsource to a service provider you know it's all about it's all about longevity and and the decision to keep something in house or outsource it when you're talking about autonomous machines and we're doing tillage we're constantly upgrading our technology. We're upgrading our software on a daily basis, hardware on a not so daily basis, but way more frequently than the 10, 15, 20 year life cycle that a grower would have one monolith machine with no upgrades. And so it makes a lot of sense that, that in automation, you deliver it as a service that you can continually upgrade your product and expand more on it, that they just can't do if they buy equipment outright. It's brilliant. You you get the tax advantages. You don't have to worry about the individual showing up or, or, or doing a bad job. And, and Gino, in a January 2021 interview with Crunchbase, you say the following. There is a myth in farming that there is unlimited supply of labor outside the farm ready to go at any moment. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Is that kind of what Aubrey w was discussing there? Yeah, exactly. This is this is the issue. You know, we're seeing California and 
frankly, rural communities all over the country. You just can't find the types of people that you trust with a half a million dollar machine to show up day in, day out, that know the operation, that are easy on the equipment, that do a quality job, that work largely unsupervised, um, you know, day in, day out. That is the problem. Um, it's, you know, there is an expense issue, but it's just that folks are less and less willing to do that. Um, urbanization is not a new thing, and it's being felt incredibly painfully in agriculture. Yeah. And you're, you're helping farmers. We, we, we've kind of alluded to this, but I'm an insurance geek. You're helping them lower their insurance costs, and, and, and you're decreasing their exposure to liability. And as we know, with if you have an incident or an accident, your liability bill goes through the roof, and you're essentially eliminating that. So you're saving them money. You can make the argument the farm's large enough, but the money they save on the insurance pays for your service, and so it's a net break even. And now you've got a really, really happy farmer. And Aubrey, is automation making farming more sustainable? Um, Gino talked about the urbanization, but there's all this talk about we have a global food shortage. Will this allow us to farmers to make more make more food and to fill more stomachs so children don't go hungry? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, this the biggest constraint that growers truly of all sizes. Um, family businesses all the way to large businesses are dealing with is labor availability. This workforce that was once prolific is depleting um, and they see it. It's not even writing on the wall. They're experiencing it today and it's driving their costs up today because of that. And so when you look at modern, modern farming and how machines have evolved and how operations are evolved, have evolved, it's all around humans driving machines. Um, and that's why you've seen a growth in size of machines as farming has gotten bigger, bigger implements have gotten bigger, machines get bigger, and it's all to make it more efficient for a human to operate them. And the problem is, is that you're limiting, your limiting variable is the availability of that human to be in the seat. And so once you take that limiter out of the equation, suddenly a world of opportunity opens up. One is you can run all hours of the day nighttime operations. So you're increasing your productivity tremendously just with machines today. Then you can start to get flexible about how you deploy this, these machines. Instead of having one giant machine, you can have a handful of very small machines that'll have lower maintenance costs, lower fuel consumption. You can start to talk about electric vehicles because they're, they're pulling smaller loads. Um, and all of that decreases the impact on the soil and the earth itself. And that increases long-term sustainability and farmability of our planet. Um, and so all, we're, not, we're not like the silver bullet to sustainable farming in the future. It's a whole collage of different enabling technologies. And I think the other layer of that is that any technology that can provide and I hate to say the word data because it's all over the place, but it can provide a data and actionable insights to growers such that they can make better informed decisions, lets them dial in and do more sustainable things. Use less pesticide, let's say, run less tillage passes because they actually have the data to confirm, oh, I only need this much versus taking a liberal approach to, well, we're just going to blast the whole crop, you know, with a roundup or we're just going to do as much as we can. It's, it's ultimately not as good for our environment. So I think Bear Flag plays a major role in it. Other companies play a major role towards increasing that overall productivity. You're right about the productivity, and we've all seen videos of the Netflix and chill. They get in the tractor, they put the Netflix on, and they chill. You're increasing <laughs> the productivity. And it's really funny if you're on Instagram, there's a rapper from Miami named Rick Ross, and he just got a John Deere tractor. And he just says he goes in there and he does what the boss does. And he has a little tractor, goes around his, his lawn, the old uh, Holyfield state. But they, Rick Ross could go out there and, and put one of your tractors and have a, a lot more efficient experience and say, I'm the automation boss. And it's technology be really cool because that's just going to take it to a whole other level. And Eugenio, will farmers be able to expand their farms because of your technology? So Rick Ross can sit there and say, I'm going to expand my land and use your tillage. And then what about farmers? Can they expand it because of your technology? Yeah. So Grayson, that's the, that's the key thing here, right? There's this misconception that autonomous tractors, you know, gives time back to farmers and they're going to spend that time on the beach or some nonsense <laughs> like that. Really, it's about increasing productivity, right? Um, there's so many things to get done. And if one of the things you don't need to do is sit in a tractor or pay someone to sit in a tractor, um, 
how much more can you get done? There's no shortage of work, um, and it's all about increasing productivity. Absolutely, um, farm farm more land with you know fewer resources. Aubrey, you mentioned this earlier in the podcast about increasing safety. Could you kind of dive a little more into that, please? Yeah, absolutely. So safety. Safety is a cornerstone of our company and every conversation that we have and every design, engineering design discussion we have, we, we talk about safety on a daily basis. And so it's very important to us um, when we're out there and it helps us empathize and understand really intimately what our customers go through in terms of keeping their employees safe. And it's, it's an ethical thing to do. And it's also like a, a huge business liability as you pointed out, um, keeping employees safe and the burden that any small to large business owner has to take on to ensure their their employees are safe doing the job that they're paying them to do. Um, So when you're not, when you don't have a human that's out there in the machine, climbing up and down the ladders, attaching the implements, you know, doing maintenance on the machine and they're remotely operating, just, just, you're resetting the baseline of safety. They're in an office. In an office, this temperature control where heat illness is not, you know, a primary concern where they've access to drinking water readily and bathroom facilities and hand washing facilities, things like that. Um, so you're you're just increasing safety flat out on your farm by implementing autonomous technology. Um, and then the other thing that that we talk about too in relation to safety is actually job quality. So because because we're out there and we're measuring our job quality, like with these perception sensors, we're able to actually ensure that the job is being done to a more excellent standard than, than we could have before. And so when people are going out and setting up jobs, we now have a better standard to compare to and set them up for success in other areas of their farm. So why in the world would not every farmer be knocking on your door begging for, for your service to run on their farm? <laughs> Great, so they are. We have, a, we have a problem, and our problem is demand we can't supply to you right now. <laughs> we have literally yeah. farmers in every corner of the country wanting to work with Bear Flag. And the exercise that Aubrey and I are going through right now is determining where you know, we can spend our resources. And, you know, that's, um, that's a large part of what we do. You know, we're, um, we, 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 we have the technology, we have the team, we have this track record of success. How quickly can we scale this? How quickly can we go to Florida? How quickly can we go to Washington State? These, you know, how quickly can we go to Indiana and the Midwest? Um, these, are the, these are the questions that we're actively discussing right now. Well, I live in Florida and we'd love to welcome Bear Flag to Florida because what you're doing <laughs> is absolutely cool. So I'm going to uh, give you a scenario. I'm, I'm Farmer Grace and I got my hat on and my overalls and I'm out there on the farm. What's the reaction from somebody like me when the tractor first shows up on my on my property? Grace, and people ask me, you know, what what I love most about my job, and it's that moment. It's that moment right there. Um, so there's the pre meeting where we learn about the operation, and you know, I'll ask you about sort of what you know what your needs are, and we'll learn about the way you go about your business and the things that are important for you, and then um, you know we'll come back with a, you know a machine, we'll do some work for you, and you know it's it, the 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 range of reactions is astounding most most of the things people say are not safe for podcast um but the the low whistles are are certainly there you know i was standing standing next to a a prolific farmer it was a it was a thrill for me to be standing next to this guy because he's a legend in ag and he's sort of sitting there shaking his head he's like i always knew this day would come but i didn't know it'd be today and it was just a thrill and honor to be standing next to him as that happened aubrey you come to farmer grayson's farm do you have to map the property prior to putting the tractor to work? Sometimes yes, and a lot of times no. So farmers farmers have mapped their property using GPS um, for many years now. This is it's not a brand new technology to map your field and to use things like this is why you get Netflix and chill in the cab is that somebody can essentially right? They can create a, a, a row that your GPS follows and they can go hands-free. Hands-free has been around for a while uh, before Veriflag. Um, and so we can capitalize on that and we do capitalize on that because we can ingest growers' maps of their fields where then we can run our algorithms to basically build paths 
per the operation that we're going to do that are the most efficient, most optimized for that specific field, machine, and implement. Um, and so that, that is the case in a lot of our growers. Of course, some people don't have field maps. And so in those cases, um, they can go and create them or we can go and create them. And it's, it's a very low burden process to do that. Barbara, Jess Roos, the, the Vice President of Ag Operations at Church Brothers Farms in California, has been a client of yours for over two years, and he's publicly stated the following, I believe their product is better than people, drivers, simply because they're human. It does a job of specifications. My vision is for them to run all night. Are you running all night at Church Brothers Farms, and is, is Josh still singing your praises? Not tonight, <laughs> but, but we have um, a big part. So from a technical standpoint, we can run at night. We have run at night. We do run at night. Um, and a commitment as a service provider to our growers is that we have to be able to meet their operational schedules. And in, in agriculture, it's not like a clock in at eight, clock out at five kind of deal. Um, and especially in peak times, you're working a lot of hours a day and through the weekend. And so by the nature of the business that we're in, we have to be able to do that. That's a requirement. And so we, we do do that. Um, and so, yeah, the, nighttime operations are critical to our customers today. They're also a large component of why this business does contribute to sustainability, to larger productivity. When you have these things running all night, you can do amazing things. Um, and so it's just a matter of building the infrastructure around it. And we do, we do have infrastructure around it today, but you can imagine to, to scale a business that's running around the clock and supporting customers around the clock that requires infrastructure. And that's, that's part of the, I'll say like IP, it's not, you know, a patent that we've developed, but that is, that's like the secret sauce of this company that, and why others can't just stand up a competitive company is because we're building the infrastructure to support these machines in operation around the clock, scaling to the country and eventually the world. It's, it's not a small feat um, to consider. The most product companies don't do and don't know how to do. Because you're going to have to figure out your supply chain. You're going to have to figure out the instruction. I have to tip my hat to you because that's going to be the key to it. You have to understand like staging areas. If you're going to go to the southeast or you're going to go to northern California or you're going to go farm out somewhere in the Dakotas, you have to understand and have the staging stations and have all that infrastructure in place. And so building upon the infrastructure statement, you know, so when a farm calls, and let's just call, here's Farmer Grayson again, I'm calling you up and I say, okay, this thing's amazing. I saw one of your tractor videos. I want a tractor on my farm. How fast can I get the tractor? So, <laughs> the answer is how many acres you got, right? <laughs> nice. We, get, we, we move quickly, and that's the benefit of the service, right? Uh, how quick can a truck get there? And that's really the answer. Can you run multiple tractors at the same time on a farm if you've got a really large farm with a lot of acreage? Oh, you, you betcha. That's the, whole, that's the whole way this works. Um, you know, just this morning, I logged on. We had five tractors um, going at the same time at, at a farm. Um, yeah, um, we, that, that's the secret sauce here. Wow. Okay. So well, farmers, please knock on their door and they're going to figure out the infrastructure and they're going to help you scale. Aubrey, are there limitations for when these farmers call you for the, for the types of farms that you can operate on today? Uh, not, not many. Um, you know, we're, so today we're doing tillage and we're not limited by the crop type at all. Um, we'll talk to any type of grower, any size grower that's interested in this. Um, we are not limited in that way. Um, I would say connectivity as any IoT driven enabled company is dealing with when you're talking about farms and 5G is something that you know, we're crossing our fingers for, but connectivity is something that we do need. There is workarounds that we've, we've implemented in the past um, when we don't have good connectivity, but they're not as scalable workarounds. So I would say the, 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 the major limitation would be you know, a lack of connectivity. But that's it, and that's a that's a problem that's decreasing every yeah, day. We're seeing the spectrum auctions for going for billions of dollars. We're getting more spectrum available, so your, your 5G needs at some point. The Comcast lobbyists, the AT&T lobbyists, still figure it out, and you'll have uh, plenty of connectivity. And then you have the second most uh, uh, powerful senator on in the Senate, sorry, on the Republican side, with Senator Thune from South Dakota, and, he, and he's a big fan of rural broadband and connectivity. So that's going to 
do really well there for the farmers. And Aubrey, I'd love to ask you, take a look here to the future. So you're automating tractors, you're killing it. You don't know how you have a door. It's probably got to be gold plated or silver plated so nobody can go through it. When will you start automating new forms of farm equipment? Well, what kind of new forms are you are you thinking, Farmer Grayson? What's, what's on your mind? I like like pest control, for example. Like if you're going to go, um, you know, for, for oranges or something or sort of automated pickers, if you're going to pick oranges or grapes, any type of that stuff that goes down the middle of the where the trees are. All of that, well, it's funny you should say the trees because we actually got our start um, in orchards and and running machines. Yep, up and down orchards. Um, so technically we've been there <laughs> and pivoted away for the for the time being um, to to really drive value at scale with tillage and other crops. Um, but looking, you know, looking forward to the future, we've designed our kit. So our our system. Um, which is hardware and software can can go on any type of tractor, any OEM. It's not specific to a certain color tractor today. And it can also go on specialized self-propelled farm equipment. Um, we've chosen to narrow, keep our scope narrow and become the best tillage company in the whole world. <laughs> um, and that's that's no small feat. And so we want to be it's excellent about what we do, we choose to do before we go and expand to other platforms, but we can certainly do that. I would say our strategy, and the, it's why we chose the tractor, because it's the most versatile platform and ag that exists, um, is to capture all of the value in the different stages of the growing life cycle. So you mentioned spraying, we're doing tillage, we're also now doing cultivation. Um, next steps would be you know, crop protection, planting, harvesting, harvesting support. That's all on our roadmap for the next couple of years. So we want to capture value to increase the total utilization of our machines at a given farm. And we think that makes the most sense. And that's what, that's what our customers want. Um, of course, we can go to other platforms as we, as we want. Um, I don't know, Egino, do you have any good ideas? Next platform? <laughs> Got I got more ideas than we have time. <laughs> <laughs> so, in a nutshell, as you know, you're building the future of farming. You're gonna you're gonna kill it on tillage, then you're gonna go to the next thing, and you're just gonna create tremendous amounts of value. Then you're gonna build this giant moat around your business. There's there's certainly a lot to do in agriculture, but we plan on being a big part of it. Well, I think you're you're going to be a big part of it. I think you're going to be a bigger part than you even assume that you're going to be. And this has been absolutely fun. And I've learned a lot. It's been interesting. I even got to play Farmer Grayson, which is super cool for anybody that knows me. That's my <laughs> dig. And uh, as, we, as we look to wrap up this super insightful, fun conversation, what would you like our listeners to take away from? And Eugenio, I'll start with you. And then Aubrey, I'd love your comments after as well. Yeah, I think for the folks outside of ag, just recognizing how big this industry is and the opportunities. This is, um, you know, you interact with ag every day, three times a day when you have a meal. Um, and it's a massive industry with a ton of opportunity. Definitely encourage folks to take a second look. Aubrey? Yeah, I would just, I would shout from the rooftops how fun and rewarding it is to work specifically at this company in automation. Um, I was a Mechie. I've, I've been intrigued about robotics since I was in college where I met Egino. And now that I don't do any of that for the company, I love working in this space in, for younger people in STEM, looking for opportunities to do something more, do something that's mission oriented, whether it's bear flag or not, I would highly encourage you to look in the ag tech space because I don't think it gets as much hype as it should. Um, and yeah, it's a really good use of your time if you wanna do something good for the world and use your superpowers as an engineer. Superpowers are cool. Ag tech is even cool and you're right, it, it, it is a tr tremendous business. and. As we've heard on today's podcast, tomorrow is today, today is tomorrow, and autonomous tractors are the future. Aubrey and Gino, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Thanks, Grayson. Thanks for having us.